So last week I was on my way to teaching the message that I taught last week. If you didn't get a chance to hear it, I encourage you, please go back and listen to it, because this is part two to that message. And as I was driving here, and my wife was talking to me, all of a sudden God began to download and talk to me about what, what he wanted to say this week. He started to give me next week's message while I was on my way to teach this, this week, that week's message. And uh, my wife's like, are you listening to me? I'm like, no, not right now. <laughs> It's a great excuse, fellas, when your wife says, did you hear what I said? Just go, oh, God was talking to me. <laughs> so I grab my phone, and, and I speak into my phone this message, because the Lord said to me this. He said, in order to become a giant, you must first defeat the giant. Amen. And I said, what does that mean, Lord? And he took me to David and Goliath. That David was just a shepherd boy. Nobody even knew who he was. And then he defeated the giant. And David would, of course, become a giant, not so much in stature, but in reputation, in success, in victory in his life. He had a giant to overcome first. The Israelites, in the same way, when they got to the promised land, there were giants in the land. Notice there wasn't giants in the wilderness. The giants didn't show up into their future until they got to the place where God had promises for them. And they had to take cities and begin to defeat the giants of the land in order to get into God's best in their life. In the same way, there are things in our lives that hold us back. They're giants. Maybe it's that low self-esteem that keeps telling you that you're no good. I'm not very smart. I'm so fat. I hate the way I look. That voice will limit you. It's a giant in your life. In order to get to the next level, you're going to have to defeat that giant. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's anger, your hot temper. Or maybe it's a wrong mentality like a poverty mindset. God just wants me to be poor. This is all I'll ever have, just living paycheck to paycheck. No, that's a giant in your life. It goes against what God says in the word. It might be what I talked about last week, where I talked about sexual immorality. That's a giant in people's lives. It might be adultery. It might be premarital sex, homosexuality. These things are giants in our lives that have to be overcome, that we have to say no to the flesh. Or maybe it's intoxication or an addiction. These are giants. You're like, Pastor, that addiction, I've tried to, I've tried to fight it. It's not getting any better. I give up. No, don't surrender. You can win. But I want to talk to you today about how to beat the giant. There was a man that moved down here from Tucson years ago. And I, I met him and began to talk to him. And he told me how when he came here, he had lost his family. He had gotten addicted to pharmaceuticals. He didn't mean to. It was one of these things that pharmaceuticals you know, prescribed to him, something that was addictive but told him it wasn't. And, and he was addicted to these pills. He began to have to get prescriptions from a different you know, shady places and are spending a lot of money to keep up with these pills and hiding it on his family, but then eventually it broke his life apart. He lost his family, he lost his wife, he lost his job. His wife moved down to Mesa, he chased her and his family down to Mesa. He got a job here locally, but he got prayer, and he decided to take on that giant once and for all. I'm gonna defeat this thing. And he got God's help, and you know what happened? He overcame that addiction. He stopped doing the pills. It was impossible. It was a big giant to defeat, but he said it was easy. With God, it was easy. On his own, he couldn't do it. But with God, it was possible. And you know what happened? He got his wife back. He got his kids back. He got his life back. He got a job with a promotion and a raise. Because why? Because when you defeat the giant, you go up a level. God was able to restore to him everything that was lost, but he said even more so than before. I have good news for you. Whatever your giant is, with God, it's possible. In fact, with God, it'll be easy. A lot of times what we do is we're trying to defeat the giant on our own. Maybe it's because churches told us we had to. Maybe it's because Christianity told us, you better get your life right and then get back with God, not understanding that you are already in right standing with Father God just when you believe Jesus. When you chose to accept Jesus Christ, God calls you the righteousness 
of God. He calls you holy and blameless. He calls you justified and glorified. He gives you his spirit to live on the inside of you as a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. You're not trying to live right so that you can get blessed. You are blessed. Come on, somebody. It's already happened, and it's a free gift because of Jesus. And what we think sometimes is, well, I better clean up my life and then return to God. No, no, you never, you, God never left you. He's with you. He knows about your junk. He's not mad at you. The Bible says that he is not counting a man's sin against him. He loves you. He's there with you. The problem is, is that you try and defeat the giant without God, you keep losing. No, no, you need God to defeat the giant. He wants to partner with you to help you defeat the giant. He wants to do the impossible thing in your life. How many know that with God, all things are possible? Come on, somebody. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 26. We're going to start here. David happens upon a battlefield where there's a giant, Goliath. And he hears this giant taunting the Israelites. For 40 days, this giant has been taunting the Israelites. Just send me your champion and fight me. And whoever wins, wins the war. And so David says, well, what will be done? Look at this in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 30. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine. In other words, he's saying, who is this man that's not even in covenant with the God that we have a covenant with? That he should defy the armies of the living God. I love the question. What will be done for this man? He says it again in, in verse 30. Listen to this. It says, then he turned away and to someone else and brought up the same matter. What will be done for this man? They told him what was going to be done. They said, well, if you defeat this Goliath, you're going to get the king's daughter as a wife you're going to get riches. The king's going to give you tons of money. And I think this is the best one ever. You don't have to pay taxes no more. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap for no taxes. Come on. Here's my point. That when you defeat the giant, there's reward. The king has reward for you. And so we've got to ask the question. You see, I believe that this giant taking, winning victory starts with your mouth. It starts with what you're going to say. And he's saying, what will be done for the man that defeats this giant? I think we should say the same thing. Maybe it's been anger that's been hard, you know, a hot temper. What will be done for the man that finally overcomes anger in his life? What will be done for the woman that finally overcomes her low self-esteem in her life? What will be done for the man that finally overcomes sexual perversion in his life? What will be done for the man that finally overcomes your poverty mindset in his life. What will be done for the... We have to ask the question, what will be done for the man when I beat this giant? Because why? Because we're, we're, we're launching out to that with our mouth. We're saying this is what I'm taking on now. My wife doesn't like Alexa. And I love Alexa in my house. I have Alexa all over the place. And, and we talk. I don't know why Kelly's so jealous of Alexa. I guess there's another woman in the house. I don't know. It's not like, I mean, I rarely take her on dates with us. It's not a big deal, but she'll glow yellow when she wants to talk, you know? She doesn't interrupt me or anything, but she's just like, hey, I'd like to talk to you sometime. And so I go walk by and I say, Alexa, read my notifications. She'll say, she'll say this. She'll go, Jason, she uses my name. She never calls Kelly by her name. But she'll be like, Jason. Devin Booker is out with an injury right now. Would you like me to hear more about that? And I'd be like, yes, Alexa, I would like to hear more about that. And we have these talks, and she plays music for me, and it's wonderful. But Kelly doesn't like Alexa, and she'll say to me, Jason, what's the weather outside, and what do I do? Alexa, what's the weather outside? And this is what I'll hear. I go, what did you do? She goes, I turned her down. I don't want to hear her. She's too loud. I walk out to the kitchen one morning and I see Alexa lifeless on the counter. She's been unplugged. <laughs> Took the power cable. I was like, what have you done? She said, well, every time I tell her to play praise and worship music, she plays praise and worship music in Espanol. It's in Spanish. I was like, what? That's really weird. So I plug her in, wait for her to boot up, and I say, Alexa, play some praise and worship music. Sure enough, she begins to play praise and worship music in Spanish, which to me is like another language, you know? No idea. It sounds like tongues to me. I don't know what's going on. So I, I thought, well, how did this happen? 
And then I remembered, we have a 16-year-old boy. <laughs> Logan has changed our preferences to Espanol, and he's laughing to himself. <laughs> so I said to Alexa, I said, play some praise and worship music in English. She switched. Now she does English every time. All I had to do was open my mouth and say what I wanted, and, begin to, and it began to change my circumstance. It's the same way in your life. We have to learn how to open our mouth. Too often, we're describing the problem. She just plays music in Espanol that's not helping me. No, 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 stop describing the problem. I don't, I'm not very good, I'm not very, here's my problem, I'm not very smart. No, stop saying that. Don't speak about your giant, speak to your giant. What will be done for the man that defeats this giant in Jesus' name? Now listen to how David says it in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 46. He says this, to the giant. He runs up to the giant and he yells at him. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. This day. I like how he says it. This is happening today and I'll strike you down and cut off your head this very day. See, I think we have to stop putting on off to tomorrow. Stop thinking I'm going to fight the giant next week. No, no, no. It's happening today. Today is the day I'm overcoming depression. It will never have a hold on me again. This is the day that anger leaves my life. This is the day that addiction leaves my life. I am over, because God's giving it into my hands. Listen, this very day, God, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And then he goes on to say this. He says, all those gathered here will know. Your family's going to know. Your friends are going to know. Your church is going to know. Everybody's going to see that it is not by the sword or spear that the Lord says, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you all into our hands. Come on, somebody. Get, those, get excited about what God's going to do. This is how we talk. And so David grabs his five smooth stones from the creek, and he puts one in his sling, and he slings it around, and he throws it at the giant. And this is how he knocks, he knocks the giant down, falls down on his face. That little stone was enough for God. He just threw a pebble at it. And God was able to take that into a strike, knocked him out, blow, lands on his face. See, it's not going to be hard for you, but you do have to throw the stone. And that stone is, is that decision that I'm not going to, I'm gonna, that I'm going to fight the giant. It's a, it could be a verse. It could be a scripture. The stone is the word of God. It could just be one scripture. Maybe, maybe it's time to, to defeat that depression in your life. It's time. Today's the day the depression is going to fall, that God's going to give it into your hands. You're going to win today, the giant falls. And so you say to yourself, I need a scripture, maybe five verses. And so you get your scriptures out, and you wake up in the morning, and you say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm turning my morning into dancing. But don't, you know, don't, the joy of the Lord is my strength. <laughs> you know, David threw the stone with some intensity. He threw it fast. Have some intensity. You're waking up in the morning and that depression, it's very real. It's very dark. It tries to attach itself to you. It's coming. You're waking up in the morning and here it comes trying to get on you again. And this time you chuck a stone at it with some intensity. You say, no, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The Lord is turning my mourning into dancing. Sorrow may come for a moment, but joy comes in the morning. Come on, somebody. You got to chuck that thing. Hit that. And then keep saying it. Keep saying it. You got to win. Got to knock it down. And then, and then I want you to say this with me. Say, I'm not done yet. You know, maybe that depression leaves. But you know it's going to try and come back again tomorrow. Maybe that, that sexual perver perversion leaves, but you know it's going to try and hit you again tomorrow. Maybe that addiction leaves today. You beat it today, but it's going to try and come back tomorrow. There's certain habits that we form in our brain that create these neural pathways that are ruts, and there could be triggers that try and take you back to the old thing, like a dog returning to his vomit. We don't want to be that. And so say this, I'm not done yet. I'm not done. David, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and verse 51, it says this, that he ran and stood over the Philistine. There's some intensity still here. He took the sword out of its sheath, so he grabs the giant sword. So this is, you have to remember, he's a teenager. This giant has a giant sword. It's a massive sword. And so I, I kind of get the picture like, kind of, 
ching, and then he started trying to pick it up. I don't know if he, uh, and then it says this, and he cut off his head with it. He cut off Goliath, that's a giant's head. I was, I was looking at, uh, how, <laughs> I don't know why I look up stuff like this. Was, what does it take to cut off someone's head? It's actually pretty intense. I think the government's watching me now that I search for this too. <laughs> Probably not a good search to, to do. But I found like the, like the, the Prince of Salisbury took 10 strikes the, to, to cut off her head. And so I thought, well, this giant might have been, I don't know, is, is he like, oh, oh, and then it doesn't, and then he goes, oh, oh, and then, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it was, you know, maybe David's just like, he's just bad. He's just like, Shoo, I don't know, I don't know. But I know he had to cut off the head. And I was talking to my wife. I'm like, what does the cutting off the head mean? Like, let's talk about this. And she said, so that it can never talk to you again. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap right there. You see, you just defeated, you defeated the giant for today out here. But if you want to defeat him permanently and kill him, you got to defeat him in here, in this brain right here, in your emotions. You have to defeat so that when that thought comes, it doesn't get played with because it's going to try and come to you. Here comes the thought and you go, no, not going to think about that. You cut it off right at the beginning. You got to cut the head off. That it does not have a voice in your life anymore. It tries to tell you that you're still no good. Low self-esteem. You're still no good. Nope. I am the righteousness of God. I am created in Christ Jesus to do amazing works. I was formed in my mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made. What am I doing? I'm cutting that thing off with the sword of the spirit, taking that head off. You know, my mom and dad, they lived a Christianity of overcoming things in their life. They didn't just stay in the wilderness. And you can, you can live your whole life as a Christian in the wilderness. But my mom and dad began to take territory. Taking territory, my dad talks about he just told this story the other, the other day that when he was a young man, just married, he, he remembered that his father was a bit of a player in the town and, and in, in, in adultery and, and wondered if, if that had tried to attach itself to him. This is part of his generation, his legacy, his things get passed down to us, you know. He was embarrassed of this and he had a great dad, but this was his, his hang up. And my, my dad said that he was newly married and he saw all the pretty, there's pretty girls everywhere. How many know that just because you get married, the pretty girls didn't disappear? <laughs> They're still there. And so he said to the Lord, take this away from me with some intensity. This was his pebble. He threw, he threw a pebble at the giant. I don't want this. I don't want to live like this. I don't want what my dad had. Take this away from me. And wouldn't you know it that by the time he got home that day, it was gone. Just that, that desire to, come on somebody. He beat it before it ever took root. My mom and dad had to take marriage too. Their marriage was rocky. They fought a lot, but because their parents had both gotten divorced on both sides, they didn't know a good marriage. So they had to take the word of God to have a good marriage. They had to, to defeat that giant, but they addressed it head on with the word of God because there are things in the Bible you can learn <laughs> about marriage that will help you have that kingdom marriage. Somebody say amen. amen. And so they did that. And then they had to overcome poverty mindset because my dad grew up so poor, it's all he knew. So the idea of money was so foreign to him, he couldn't get into the idea that he could be blessed in order to be a blessing. And so he had to see that cut off. That giant had to be defeated. Smoking was something he wanted it to be. My mom and dad, my mom just got delivered automatically. She's like, I don't want to smoke. And that giant just fell down dead and she never smoked again. My dad also never smoked again, but it was a little different for him. I asked him recently, dad, do you want a cigarette? He said, yes. <laughs> we were on the fishing trip and out on the boat and it was a cold, crisp morning. And it was just that perfect condition for him to have a good smoke. And I said, but he said, but I still say no to it. I say no to it every day. Sometimes we have to keep cutting that thought off every day, but you can do this. You have what's called self-control. You can beat this every single day of your life. It's gotten easier for him, a lot easier, but he still has to say no. Romans chapter 8 and verse 12 says it like this. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Who are you in debt to? It says not to the flesh. You don't owe your flesh jack. It doesn't get to tell you what you owe it, what it needs. It says no. He, not to live according to the flesh, 
For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That doesn't mean mortal death. It just means that your life's going to fall apart in every possible way. You're going to have crud, crumbles, fire, tragedy, mess. It's going to be a rocky, rocky life for you. Why? Because you're, you're being driven by your body. You can be a believer and still let your body own you. But, but there's a better way of life. And God's like, if you want to be in my will, you have to learn how to say no to this thing because it'll wreck you. It wants to do things it's not allowed to do. It wants to eat things it's not allowed to eat. It wants to sleep with things it's not allowed to sleep with. You have to own this thing. You have to say no to that body of death. That's what Paul called it. And so he says, you've got to put this, well, watch this, but if by the Spirit, listen to this, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This is on you. Now, it's going to be strengthened by the Spirit. You're going to use the Spirit of God to overcome the giant, but it's on you. It's your move to make. Like you're playing tennis, and it's your serve. You're playing pickleball, and it's your serve. You're playing ping pong. It's your serve. It's your turn. You have to decide that I'm going to fight the giant. You have to be like David and say, what will be done for this man? And then you have to say, today is the day that that giant dies. Come on, somebody. It's your move. God will help you, but you have to make the decision decision that today's the day can I get somebody to say amen Amen. the Israelites when they took the promised land um, Joshua if you can go through in Joshua chapter 10 it really goes through it quickly that he went to this city and he took it and then he went to this city and then he took it he went to then he went to this city and he took it went to Mekedah then he went to Libna and he's defeating the Canaanites the Hittites the Jebusites the Gezer He's going from place to place, one at a time. This is how the Spirit does it. He goes, I want you to work on this giant right now. And when you defeat that giant, there will be reward. And you're becoming a giant. You will have elevation. And God is going to help you defeat this giant. When that one's done, then you can move on to the next one. It's just one at a time. Maqueda actually meant the place of the shepherds. So it had a meaning, this, this place he was taking. It meant church. You know, part of my, my being born again and following Christ means I go to God's house, which is not easy. You had to get up today on your day off. You had to get showered. You had to wash kids up, some of you. And then you had to drive somewhere to go to church. Lots of people decide I'm not going to do that. And they come up with excuses why they don't want to do it. But the reason they don't want to do it is because it's their day off and they don't want to do it. But you came to church because you took the place of Maqueda. Give yourselves a hand clap. Now, you're amazing. That's not normal behavior, you guys. And and without you, I would have no one to talk to. I would probably just set a bunch of Alexas up and (laughs) talk to Alexa. But praise God that you're here. I still brought Alexa, but anyways. And so you've got Maqueda, which means this in the the place of the shepherds. And you've got Libna, which means the righteous road or saying no to the things that God says no to. You've got the Canaanites, which was sexual perversions. And you've got the the Hittites, which was... uh, which was, uh, read it to me, fear. fear. So they all have a meaning. Then you've got the next one, which is the Jebusites, which is, yeah, low self-esteem, be downtrodden. And, and we've got to overcome these things. You've got geezer, which means country music. We've got to get this <laughs> out of our life forever. Like we can't, we have to say no to the things God says no to. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and you have to fill it up with something. Go get some rock music. It's going to change your life. You're going to be better for it. Come on, give the Lord some praise right there. That's important. (laughs) But they would dispossess a region so that they could possess it. They would defeat a giant so that they could become a giant. You can't possess the promise until you dispossess what's occupying the promise. You can't possess the abundance of God until you dispossess that poverty mindset. But this is that giant that God is going to help you defeat. And you're just going to use the word of God and your, de- your decision. It's going to be so easy. There was a woman that I spoke to after a service uh, maybe two or three months ago. And she said, Pastor, can you pray with me? I said, absolutely. I'd never seen her before. And uh, I said, what's going on? So she began to tell me over the next 10 minutes about 20 years of tragedy desolation everything went wrong that could go wrong and and I, I i i listened to her and i thought to myself how long have you been i asked her how long have you been a believer 
She said, oh, for 35 years. I'm thinking to myself, this is not God's plan for your life. So I asked her the question, are you planted in a church? She goes, well, no. I said, because the Bible says that those who are planted in God's house will flourish. And I'm seeing that you're not flourishing. So I think, I think this is, might be part of what's missing is you've got to plant somewhere in God's house and then you'll start to see that flourishing happen. She said, well, I don't need to do that because 20 years ago, God told me I don't need to be in church anymore. I said, well, but, but why would God exempt you from church when all the rest of us have to go? You know, the Bible says to forsake not the gathering. The Bible says don't forsake the Sabbath. It's very, very clear about the gathering and being in God's house. And so I said, I don't think God would say that. And here's the thing that, that Satan does is he, come, he comes to people and he tries to sound like God, right? Eve, he comes to Eve and he comes to us as an angel of light, the Bible says. He tries to sound like Jesus and he might say something, but you have to check the Bible and say, well, that doesn't sound like God. God would never say that because God already said this and he wouldn't contradict himself because he's God and he's not a man that he should lie. Come on, somebody. So I said, I don't think the voice you heard was God, but she wasn't having that. But this is what my point is, is that one lie believed can really wreck your life. He doesn't, Satan doesn't need you to believe all the lies. He just wants to get you with one lie. And if you can believe one lie, he can wreck you. He can take you down the path of desolation and brokenness. This is not what God has for you. You could stay with that giant. You could just let it alone. I'm not going to try and defeat I've already tried to defeat it, Pastor. It's unbeatable. And you could live the rest of your life under that limitation. But don't do that. With God, all things are possible. This is going to be easy. Stop trying to beat it on your own and begin to beat it with the word of God. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. I was on a, a way to preach at a church in Yuma, Champion Church in Yuma, the Bloomfields, greatest people in the world. And I was going to go there and preach on a Sunday morning. And I didn't want to leave on Saturday night. It's just Yuma. It's like three hours away. So I thought, well, I'll just drive there Sunday morning. I'll get up early. I got to be there at 8.30. So I'll, I'll leave the house around 5.00 and drive to Yuma, right? Make, it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. And besides that, top down, 80s rock music, road trip. Oh my gosh, I'm super excited about this. I've got a BMW Turbo. Come on, somebody. No, give the Lord a hand clap for great cars. Yeah. Um, I buy and sell cars. It's something that I do, and I make, my cars always make me money. Praise God. They're like cows for me, and it's livestock, so... So I bought, I bought this car to make money with it, but while I'm driving, I'm going to put that top down, and I'm going to cruise to Yuma at the speed limit, which is 90. <laughs> That's the speed limit to Yuma. I don't know if you knew that. So there's this road called, I think it's called the 183. It's kind of out the way towards Tucson. It's not the main way to Yuma. It's more of like this kind of two-lane, like with oncoming traffic road. It's very beautiful, very windy, very like hilly, super scenic, no city, nobody around. Just go. I was super excited about this road trip. So off I go and I'm cruising and I'm hauling and I got to make it there in time because I got to preach. And all of a sudden I see brake lights. I'm like, who's, what are we doing? It's like six in the morning. And there was like, seven or eight cars in front of me, all going about 30 miles an hour. And as you kind of get around different corners, you're looking to see, what are we waiting for? I see one of these big trucks where they're moving a house. You ever seen these? Where it's like the wide hole load house. And I'm like, I'm not going to make it in time if I have to be behind this big. Nobody can pass because it's windy roads, you know. And so I have to wait. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And nobody's moving. All of a sudden, I came around this corner and there was a straightaway with long enough that I could make it safely and stay under the speed limit, of course. <laughs> and so we hit the turbo, and I blew past all the cars, and I blew past the big truck, and suddenly I was free to get to my destination. This truck represents the giant in your life. It's holding you back. It's limiting you. It's keeping you slow. It's going to cause you to miss your destination. But God has a plan for you, and he has a victory for you, and he wants to help you defeat that giant. you got to kick on the turbo and pass this thing so that you can be free to go and get to where God's taking you. Come on, somebody. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul puts it like this. He says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? 
run in such a way as to get the prize. Come on, people of God. We're not complacent. We're not mediocre. We're not average. We're going places. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that doesn't even last. But we do it to get a crown that lasts forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. This thing has got to serve me and serve God. I don't serve this thing. He says, I, I make this my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. See, in order to become the giant, you got to learn how to defeat the giant. The giant's gonna be easy for you to defeat, but today the giant is coming down. Make a decision in your mind, in your heart. But today the giant's coming down. Start with your mouth. Get the scripture out. Get the sword of the spirit out and see that thing come down. God is partnering with you and wants to help you. I want to pray for you right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for this word and that the giant is falling. That you've already given us victory over these things, Lord. This next stage in our life, Lord, the thing that's been holding us back and limiting us, Today is the day that falls. In the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for victory over the giant. I thank you, Lord, that you silence the voice of that, of that wrong voice, that thing in our wrong thoughts, the wrong emotions, Lord, that they're gone from us. That we're, I thank you, Lord, that you give us the strength to win in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that these people, everyone within the sound of my voice, is delivered and set free by your spirit in Jesus name. We put to death the deeds of the body. And today is the day that that giant falls. And today is the day that the Lord is giving that giant into our hands. And today is the day that that giant will fall and be fe feeding the birds of the air and the beasts of the field in Jesus name. And everybody around us in our world will know that the battle is the Lord's. Thank you, Father, in Jesus name. Give the Lord some praise right now. Say, I'm free. Did you receive something today? I just encourage you to be generous. Help us get this word out to the rest of the world. And, and Thank you so much for tuning in today. And let me ask you a question. If you were to face eternity today, do you know what eternity looks like for you? And would you have peace with Father God? Here's the good news. God has already offered the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will believe. And you might say, believe what? Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for your sin, rose from the dead, Make him the Lord of your life today, and you can know before this episode turns off where you will spend eternity. It'll be in the kingdom of heaven with Father God. Repeat this prayer after me. Dear Father God, forgive me of all my sin. And Jesus, I believe in you. You're the Son of God who died for sin, rose from the dead. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now find a great church to get yourself plugged into.